Hello and welcome to Dennis Wick First Fridays, the first ever panel discussion we're hosting. And like the title says, uh, we'll be hosting these on the first Friday of every single month. My name is Mary Galini and I'm the artist manager and product specialist for Dennis Wick North America. And uh, I'll be hosting today's panel discussion. Um, these panel discussions are focused to discuss the situations that make us or break us as musicians. And today's discussion uh, is going to deal with getting a gig and keeping the gig, which for this time of year is really an important discussion since Easter is coming up and it is a very lucrative holiday for brass players. And this specific holiday throws us into some situations we might not necessarily always deal with throughout the year. So without further ado, let's introduce our panelists and let's start with you, Christopher Bill. Hi, I'm Christopher Bill, uh, the internet's busiest trombonist. Uh, I make YouTube videos, but I've also had a long running Easter gig for almost a decade now. So uh, yeah, I look forward to talking about this with you guys who might have a little more experience shopping around and, and getting other gigs. Chris, number two. <laughs> Uh, my name is Chris O'Hara. I'm a trumpet player with Alliance Brass, and um, I've also had kind of a, a standing Easter gig for about a, about a decade now. So, yeah. And Mr. Ryan. Yeah, I'm uh, Ryan Christensen. I'm the uh, trombonist of the Dallas Brass and principal trombone with the Milwaukee Ballet Orchestra, as well as just a fairly active freelancer here in the Chicago area. <clears throat> um, I, I haven't had a Easter gig for like one Easter gig for a whole decade. So I've been, I've been bouncing around a little bit for the last uh, couple of years, moving between Minneapolis and Chicago. And uh, yeah, um, starting a new one this year and excited to talk about that experience too. So. Great. Well, let's open it up with getting the Easter gig and we can look at this from a couple different ways. Um, maybe let's start with um, you don't have an Easter gig. What are some ways that you can get yourself out there and you want an Easter gig? I mean, just from seeing all of the things, maybe maybe it's different for me, but on Facebook, I feel like every other day there's somebody posting about an Easter gig. And so probably a good bet is to just say, just put it out there and be like, I don't have an Easter gig. You know that I play trombone, you know, and just have that in the back of people's minds uh, that know you and that know you're a good player. That's just like, I, I don't have an Easter gig yet. And if that's out there in the world, they will at least think of you. Definitely. And then, you know, whenever you're playing a gig with somebody, the, you know, especially if it's someone that you, you like working with, you find that you enjoy working with them at, at the gig that you're currently on, you know, kind of mention and, you know, bring it into the conversation. Yeah. I'm, you know, I don't really have anything set up for Easter this year. Um, you know, what are you doing? Kind of things kind of get the ball rolling along those lines and just kind of, you know, networking from, from that angle. And Ryan, you said that you, you've, not had the same Easter gig from year to year, but you're generally playing on Easter. And so would you say that a lot of your connections have come through that way through, you know, previous gigs or? Yeah, to some extent, I, I think, uh, you know, when I think about getting an Easter gig, it's just kind of a microcosm of freelancing in general. It's, um, I've been on the scene. I mean, I think the things that I think about when it comes to freelancing is you want to be present and dependable and you want to sound good. So if you can do those things in other contexts, then your name will get around and people would be more likely to give you a call. Um, yeah. So when I, when I came to Chicago, I, I had some connections in the area that were getting multiple calls and just got one through that. Um, <clears throat> and then this year I'm starting a new one. I got asked if I wanted to uh, put a group together and um, that I got that contact through another person I played with pretty regularly. So it's a, uh, it's not even, I'm not I've never been in a position where I've been like asking, but it's just being around and proving that you can be a dependable and reliable musician and player usually comes through so yeah so and I think you mentioned you're contracting this gig so as a contractor um, you're in the position where you are actually looking for musicians to play with and um, are you just kind of going and trying to see whoever will take the gig or how what's your process for finding musicians well I think you know the things that I just mentioned in terms of being a good freelancer are the things that I look for in a musician that I want to hire um, number one uh, they're dependable person, reliable, um, probably not going to flake out on the gig or not necessarily take it if they get another one that's like $10 more or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, and people that will work well together, people that are um, just generally like nice, easy to work with type guys or girls, you know, whoever. 
um, as well as, um, yeah, people then, then people that sound great and people that use their ears well and can step into a, uh, um, a freelance gig where they maybe haven't played with these other people before, maybe they have, or maybe they're doing music they haven't seen before, but they can use their ears well and accommodate to the situation and, and make it work. So that's yeah. kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah, and I think you bring up an interesting point there um, about the someone who won't take the gig and then back out on you because I got another one that's $10 more. Um, when you are looking for Easter gigs and shopping around for Easter gigs or any type of gigs, um, there are qualities in that gig that you need to decipher if it's worth your time ahead of time because nothing will get you never hired again faster than accepting a gig and then giving some shady reason for backing out because realistically you found something that was, you know, better paying, which always gets found out. <laughs> yeah. It's hard to hide that stuff because it's a small world among musicians. So when you're, when you're shopping around for gigs or you're in the process of, of getting your Easter gigs, what type of information do you guys as players definitely want to get from the contractor or the person who's hosting the gig so that you know whether this is worth your time and or not worth your time? How are you judging that situation? Well, there's the, the initial things like, you know, well, how much does the gig pay? How much, um, how much time is going to be involved in the gig? How many services are there for, for Easter services? There could be several. It could involve a, a vigil the night before. It might not. So things like that, you want to kind of figure out how much time you're going to be putting into it. Plus, um, like, are there rehearsals and how many rehearsals and when are the rehearsals? Um, one of the things that I always like to find out, especially if it's not like a, a solo gig, you know, as a, as a trumpet player, very often you'll get called to do these things as just a solo. So it's just the trumpet player working with the organ and the choir or, or whatever other music uh, they may have at, at the gig. Um, but if it's in a, a situation where I might be playing in a brass quintet, I want to know who those other people are. Am I going to enjoy the experience? <laughs> I um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have a a fun thing that uh, one of my musician friends told me. He said a gig should have good music, good pay, or good networking, and should at least have two. So that's usually a good rule of thumb. And if it if it has only one, it better be a lot of that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. That's really good advice. <laughs> Thank you, Nick Lawfer. Yeah. Nice oh, artist. <laughs> Um, well, great. This is, this is great information just in the first uh, nine minutes of our discussion here. So let's move on to the actual performance side, which um, I think a lot of people will be interested um, to get into discussing. Um, so you can practice the whole week. You can practice all your music and know every note and then get in and completely flop on an Easter gig. And the reason I wanted to do this is because um, in my day-to-day -day work with musicians, there are not very many musicians who have the opportunity to play in a chamber music setting on a regular basis. And chamber music is a completely different animal than soloing or playing with an organ or playing with an orchestra or playing with a band. Um, when you're playing with two, three, four other brass players, there are specific roles that you need to play. And so each of you, the um, reason why I invited you guys to, uh, to be panelists is that you all are playing in a, a chamber music setting, or Chris, you create your own chamber music settings in a lot of interesting ways. Um, so let's, you know, you're a new player, or you, you're playing a gig for the first time, and you're walking into a chamber music setting in this Easter gig. Um, what, what are some of the things that you want to do right away before, you know, maybe in, before you even start playing with the group, or in that first couple of measures you're playing together? How do we blend, you know, what are the first things you're listening for to be a good group member? Well, I think for me, actually, the first thing that I would do coming into a situation where I don't know everybody in the group or whatever, I mean, this is this is really simple, but especially if we're in a rehearsal situation or something, the first thing to me um, is just to introduce myself to everybody, make sure I know everybody's name, get straight with that. Because that actually makes, in, in terms of rehearsal, I think that makes a big difference. Um, if you want to be able to fix something, if you're coming in as the new guy, you kind of want to more or less keep your head down, you know, and... Uh, um, just, you know, do your work, but if you can, you know, develop a good rapport and meet people and, um, be friendly and upfront right away, then when you get into the rehearsal process, it makes everything a lot easier. Um, <clears throat> and then beyond that, once you're actually playing or you're on the gig or however it works out, 
Um, I think the biggest thing for me is to make sure that I got my ears working right away. And I'm kind of, you know, since, since I'm sitting as a trombone player, um, I'm listening right away to usually the trumpet players. I usually, I always joke, I'm from a trumpet playing family. My dad's a trumpet player, my brother's a trumpet player, grandpa's a trumpet player, whatever. I escaped. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I always kind of joke that it's like I, in almost every musical context, like my role is to try to make the trumpet players feel good. Like I'm trying to listen to um, that for tuning and for articulation and just be sure that you kind of pick a spot or pick somebody that you're going to like try to play with. Um, you know, if you're listening for tuning, usually listening down to the tuba or whatever, but basically um, have some place where you're focused and you're trying to match and blend right away so that you're not coming in and sticking out like a sore thumb. Um, and if you can come in with that kind of intentionality to your chamber music playing, it's going to uh, set you up pretty well because you'll start noticing things and without even thinking about it, you're going to be playing more in tune, you're going to be playing more in time, and you're going to be more part of the group if you start picking somebody to listen to, for sure. Ryan, can I just say that I love that that's, that's the perfect way to think about this, man? Like, how can I make the trumpet player sound better? Oh, this is... I knew it. I should have known better than this. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I will say, having played with Ryan, he does that. He, he does make everyone's job easier. So that's, that's pretty awesome. Um, I think there's kind of a hierarchy with a, with a performance or a gig like that where it's like, and correct me if, if you, you disagree, but like the director, you have to make the director happy first, right? Sometimes that's easier. Sometimes it's not as easy. <laughs> and then kind of, you're right, like the lead trumpet players next, then the other musicians, and then you. Like you're kind of the last step there that like, it might be really awkward for you to play all this stuff and like be juggling all of those things at once. But that's kind of what you have to do before you even get to yourself, just kind of like settling in and, and relaxing. Usually those first... uh ensemble rehearsals with a new group with new people it is kind of awkward because you're trying to understand everybody's personality and how they are interacting with each other and there is this hierarchy of like just good gig mentality of like the director has to be happy first they're the ones that that are putting it on and then the other musicians in order to make the music actually work so i don't know it's something to think about i think absolutely i mean i i very rarely think about how how do i feel about right how things are going in the gig it's does the is is the band sounding good whether that's you know a brass quintet and orchestra or whatever um is are the people that i'm playing for maybe maybe not even just the the person who hired me mm -hmm. but is everybody how is everyone else responding to it and if and i guess it's putting that music side first and a little less about um like well what am i getting out of this and what how does it feel on my face um, I have a question for for all you guys. Um, if something's really not working and there's like a problem and it's your first time there, do you speak up or do you just kind of settle in because you're not you're the new guy? Um, I would say in general in that situation, that's where it comes like if you get a sense of the room. Number one, like sure. if it's a if it's a real vibe and it's like okay, it's not like okay for me to talk or if there's already you know it just depends on the group um but that's one of the big things for me it's like if you can come in and have that like just introduce yourself and get like a base level yeah. like I'm comfortable with you um and hopefully like you're by this point your playing is spoken up enough that you like you don't sound like you don't know what you're talking about you know what i mean um <clears throat> that you can do it and but always in a modest very humble, very understated. Like for me, I always take the practice of if I can take a way to turn that on myself and ask a question about like, maybe I'm doing something wrong here. Maybe the problem's me. Mm -hmm. uh, or is there something else I can do to change this? Start with yourself and maybe it'll get fixed. And if you know specifically it's something else, then maybe after that first time, if something doesn't get fixed, then maybe bring it to the, or like, and, and just in general, like, if it's like if one chord's like super out of tune or something like that, like don't say, "Hey, uh, second trumpet, your C's a mile sharp." Like that's not the way to win any friends. Um, but what you want to do is, you know, you can say take the approach. It's like, you know, I think you know when we hit this F chord at this, um, you know, at, at this cadence or wherever, you know, um, you know, I really think we could probably try to tune that up. Or like, yeah, let's 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 get the root and then the fifth. Okay, cool. Yeah, you know. It's, or, you know or maybe I'm having a hard time uh, getting my pitch in on that chord. Can we can we tune that chord as a group? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Cause I, and honestly, and that's one of those things for me too, is it's like that as much as that can come from a genuine place as to, as opposed to like a kind of obvious, like, I think I'm right. And I'm trying to like fix this, like with kind of a passive aggressive way. Like if you're listening to somebody else and you're trying to actually match them, sure. Then you're on it. That's going to be honest. It's like, I couldn't find where you were putting this note. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can make a lot of things work that are a little bit out. If you're really, really locked in here, if you're really listening. Well, you can make things that shouldn't work work sometimes you know um so just take that from a perspective and say you know what I, i'm not finding like i'm not finding exactly where this needs to lock in can you help me out and uh we'll see and i and as a trombone player i find that is a particular like especially on the trombone thing because we play with a giant tuning slide you know so um it, it's 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 on us a lot of times to make that that fit but um i don't know that's that's usually how i'd approach that i think it's a good question yeah. If all else fails, just blame it on the choir, right? Oh, that's true. <laughs> well, the organ's out of tune, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I was going to say, that's, that's really important, though, with, um, you know, we were just kind of talking about it, like, as an example of how to fix things. But the being in tune is just so important, and especially if it's, um, if, if this is, uh, like, your first time with a group, or maybe you're the first time you've pl- you're playing this sort of gig, um, if there's a lot of chamber music involved, making sure that you're really using your ears, making adjustments. Um, you know, it it's okay to, to continuously move the slide on your instrument. Like I, I've played with people who like they tune once and <laughs> that's it. Um, but the, there's nothing wrong with making adjustments as you go, because you know, as Ryan put you know earlier, you got to make the, the first trumpet player sound good. <laughs> and um, if the band's <laughs> if the band's out of tune. Like the the first trumpet player is gonna die because they're constantly working. So anything you can do to help the band's overall intonation is gonna make the the whole rest of the performance sound better. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, something that came up early in this conversation or uh, early in this specific section was um, the director and. Mm-hmm. I, I think I've had less cringeworthy moments performing with other musicians uh, doing bad music things as I've had cringeworthy moments of how people are communicating with the director. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so can you guys agree? I, uh, there's just some really bad etiquette out there. So what are some really healthy ways to talk to the director? Like, you know, if something, if you have a question about the music or if you have a question about your role in the music, when do you ask these questions? How do you ask these questions? <laughs> I've heard you never ask a question to the director. It's the only way to keep the job. <laughs> I don't know if that's good advice for music, but yeah, I've heard that one. Like the the only way to keep your job in an orchestra is never ask a question to the director. Yeah, I mean, kind of, kind of piggybacking on that. I mean, one of the things that I, I think of here is uh, like on Easter morning in particular, like mm-hmm. there's a choir, like that director is busy. He's running around. He's got a lot of moving parts the last person you're going to talk to about a question is that guy. If you need to ask that question, if you've gone through every other person you can think of, then you ask that guy that question. But like until that, yeah, you want to, you want to do everything you can to fix it. Um, And honestly, it's like, if you're, if you're performing with like a church, like a regular church choir that isn't pros, like your question probably is the least of the concerns musically that day, most likely, Um, you know? So if it's something small, you know, just make sure that you can, you know, if it's a real question, it's a real problem. You know, lean over to the person next to you so you can figure it out and, you know, kind of go through the, the chain of command, so to speak, you know, and end up there if you need to. But, um, but yeah, just uh, as much as you can, um, try to figure it out on your own and then uh, ask the director. Just no need to be needy, you know. Yeah, I think there's a, there's a big ego part of asking questions in front of the entire ensemble. Like, it's like, I know how this is supposed to go. I'm going to ask the, this question so you know that I know. And it's like, just fix it. It. you know your job is to not be in the way just fix it talk to the other musicians fix it no one ever has to know that there was a problem there and that you were the reason that it got fixed like just fix it that's your job right. now, i like that idea of the you know going through the chain of command so if like you're if you're in a, a chamber ensemble i mean it's just kind of like in an orchestra like third trumpet doesn't ask the, the question of the music director it, they they go through their section and then if if it something that needs to be figured out the principal will take care of it usually after rehearsal 
Um, so same thing here. Like if you're in a chamber group and you know that somebody is the, the de facto leader of the, of the group, whatever, you know, kind of ensemble it is, talk to them if you can do it in a way that doesn't disrupt the rehearsal. And if they don't have an answer for you, then they will figure it out afterwards because usually the music director you know like what ryan was saying they're busy they, they've got so much going on and they have a very small amount of time for their rehearsal so they're gonna do they just want to get through everything and make sure everything sounds as good as they can after that then maybe they'll, when they have a moment to breathe you can say hey i just want to make sure we're making this great um this and that's only if that's you know your your place in the hierarchy mm -hmm. yeah yeah, definitely. That's all. That's all great advice. Um, so, um, in that morning that you're playing, in that short amount of time you you have with every uh, with everybody, you've gone through all your music, you've practiced it, you've made sure you have um, the right mutes or whatever you're going to need. Um, what tool? What other tools should? Uh, should you be bringing? And I'm going to start with Chris O'Hare because this was, I'm a trumpet player as well. Chris and I used to play in a group together, but um, there are some tricks of the trade along there that I don't know that if you're not playing in a brass quintet regularly, that I'm not sure you're thinking of what all your tools at your fingertips are. So Chris, you leave this one off and. Uh... Sure. So thing, things that have with you, I guess, and this, this goes to, you know, hopefully before the morning of, but when you come to your rehearsal or whatever, bring bring whatever you can that you you even remotely think might be useful for the gig. So make sure you have mutes. Make sure you have your B flat trumpet, your C trumpet, maybe your uh, your E flat trumpet. Uh, definitely a piccolo. Never show up to an Easter gig without a piccolo trumpet because then you you might very well be surprised. Um, if you have one, bring a cornet, bring a flugelhorn. Uh, to give yourself as many options as possible. Um, bringing mutes is always good because there are very few times that I've played with any kind of chorus that I haven't gotten a hand from a conductor asking me to play just a little bit softer. And if I can do that, great without injuring myself or affecting my sound, but that might be an opportunity to play something muted that even if it isn't marked, that might be something to suggest. Um, just to make life easier. But you know, making sure that you have as many options as possible for the gig so that so that you're gonna make it through. If you're playing something that's in the upper tessitura of the range consistently, that might be something to play on a piccolo trumpet or maybe an E flat trumpet, something like that. If you do need something that's just a little bit softer, not quite so projection oriented, that might be a, a cornet. Um, just some, something you can do to make your life a little bit easier. Um, one thing for me, uh, this is incredibly self-convicting right now, anybody who's ever rehearsed with me, is don't forget to bring a pencil. <laughs> you know, the morning of, be sure you got that. I always forget. I always forget. But it's just like there's going to be something. If you're playing with a the choir, there's going to be some roadmap. There's going to be something from the director. There's going to be something like play this quieter. And if, you, if you're on like a one service gig, you got one shot. You don't get another one, <laughs> you know? So if you mess it up, uh, mess it up the one time uh, and it's like really obvious and bad, well, that might be something that would call into question you getting the gig next year. But um, so just anything you can do to um, be sure that you're prepared, you know, so pencil is always good. And that's just, that's also a little self reminder. Hopefully I'll watch this video before my Easter gig and be like, Ryan, remember your pencil. <laughs> uh, I, I like to think about that stuff, especially for people who are just starting out. Um, and maybe this is one of your first gigs. Maybe you got really lucky and had, have a gig with some, you know, real heavy hitters. Uh, these are things that you can do. You, it's super easy. Like, bring a pencil, but don't just bring one, bring two. So then Ryan's there. You can give him a pencil. And <laughs> now he owes you one. I've people like you my entire life, man. <laughs> and like, you'll remember my face, you know, next time you have to hire somebody, you'll be like, well, he was like uber prepared. I mean, if you really want to go all out, I mean, don't go crazy, but like you could bring an extra straight mute and you could really save somebody's butt, you know? Uh, you, pencils are easy. I don't know, stands, usually churches have stands, but I mean, I have two wire stands that I bring with me all the time. They fit in one case together. It's not heavy. If I'm bringing one, I can bring two. Super easy. You can save somebody's butt that way. 
Um, if you really want to go all out, you could print out all the music, like all the different parts. If somebody forgets it or something day of, again, you could, if you can be the person that saves somebody's butt in a gig like that, they're going to remember you for a really long time. Uh, and just like be on time, obviously be 15 minutes early and do all the stuff you're supposed to do. It's, it's the easy stuff that we tell everybody, especially new professional musicians who are trying to cut their teeth and everything like it's the easy stuff that people screw up it's not the you know playing at not missing a note on the gig or anything like that it's the easy stuff showing up 15 minutes early being there with two pencils the whole thing like that's the stuff people will remember not that you missed a note in measure 32 on easter like they don't remember that stuff i mean they might remember if you do go above and beyond on that but it's the easy stuff that that is more important, I think, for networking and, and rehiring. Absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, I kind of want to jump in on, on what you were just saying there. Um, that showing up early thing that, I mean, always, always, always like the, what, what's the rule, you know, um, on time is, you know, late is unacceptable. On time is late and early is on time. But, you know, we were talking about like things you want to know before, you know, before you decide on the gig, is there parking? Mm -hmm. Is there parking at the place that you're playing at? Are you playing at a church in a, in a big city? Are you in downtown Chicago and there's no place to park or the, the one public parking place is, you know, 10 minutes away. You want to make sure you have all that kind of information that you've thought that through before, before you, you even think about getting ready, you know, the, the night before, make sure you're ready to go and you know, you have your plan. Like, I know that it's going to take me this long to get to the church. I know it's going to take me this much longer if I stop and get Dunkin' Donuts. <laughs> and I know it's going to take me, you know, this much longer to find my place to park and make sure that I'm there so that I am that 15 minutes early. Yeah. That's yeah. I think that the travel, the, the travel and the parking is something that over, gets overlooked a lot. And, you know, just for the time of day, you know, you're traveling and, you think, oh, it, it's, I've been there a thousand times. It takes half an hour to get there. But um, but then you didn't factor in rush hour because it's a different time of the day, and that, that'll shoot you in the foot. And I think what Chris Bell said about positive reinforcement is really important also, like um, having that extra pencil, saving someone's butt in the small things. We worry so much about the negative reinforcement that we feel like is happening when we miss a note or, you know, some hiccup happened during a performance. But I don't think people re remember that stuff as much as they do the positive stuff like, oh, they had a pencil for me or, um, oh, they had an extra copy of this for me. It, that goes a lot, a lot further. And I have to say on a lot of the gigs that I go to, I am always worried about time. So I'm annoyingly early there but a lot of times it affords me time to meet the director ahead of time <laughs> because the director isn't stressed out before the rehearsal <laughs> they're usually stressed out after the rehearsal before the rehearsal they come in and you're you know warming up in a beautiful big church and they say oh what a beautiful sound you have and you know you get this nice little chat because you know you can't sound bad in a church that no one's playing in <laughs> beautiful you know so it, it's kind of a nice time if you want if you want the opportunity to meet the director or you know have some face time it, it opens up that opportunity as well sometimes so. That's a really good point. I haven't thought about that. Um, so moving on to our last portion of this discussion, um, keeping the gig and getting more gigs out of it. That's something I think as a freelancer, you have to always have in the back of your mind. So, you know, you're meeting people for the first time on this gig. You're meeting music directors. How, how have you guys um, approached making that one gig into multiple gigs or getting more gigs out of that one gig? I mean, I have, I always try to send an email after every good interaction I have, gig or otherwise, networking or otherwise, that just says like, you know, it was so nice to play with you. It was so nice to play for you. This was a really great opportunity. You know, I hope, I hope to work with you again. Um, I think that goes a long way. I don't think many people do it. So it, you'll kind of stand out if you just do that. I've had directors do it to me, you know, and it, it goes a long way. They say, oh, this was really great. Like the gig's, gig's over, you know, we're, we're not going to work together again in, in months. But when they send that email, it's kind of like, okay, you know, they actually did uh, have a good experience with this. And, and I don't know, I think, I think those emails go a long way. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a big thing um, uh, for me too, is making sure that you, 
yeah, if you had a good experience or you did enjoy it, you know, just be sure to let them know. Um, and then on top of that, again, just coming back to just some of the freelancing basics, you know, um, if you want to get called again, make sure you do all the simple stuff that, that Chris was talking about earlier. You know, if you can do that stuff, it's much more likely that you're going to get called again. Um, yeah. And just basically be around, be dependable and be like nice to work with you know, do that. Um, and a- again, like I, also try to make sure that I get people's contact information. I know that cards aren't always exchanged anymore, but I do try to get people's phone numbers. Uh, don't just give them yours. Also get theirs. Um, and, you know, you can send them. And then, you know, if you want to, you can send them a text message instead of sending an email if you want to be a little less formal or whatever. But whatever, um, you know, whatever you can do to make sure that your name is still in their ears a little bit or in their head when after that interaction after that interaction is done um i know this is becoming old school but i still use facebook for that you know i mean i when i play a good game with somebody i always try to um get them on facebook like right afterwards i'm my my wife makes a lot of fun of me for that because i'll do it like right away because i'm I'm probably spend too much time on facebook but anyways um you know i I think stuff like that because then it's like you know at least and for me that's had a really much higher return rate than just like okay i played the gig and he has my phone number and then i have not talked to this person or like he's not seeing you know on facebook you know like your picture pop up or on instagram whatever social medias you use you know it's like doing pop up a little bit there you know it's a good thing and um just keeps you a little bit more relevant um and thought of i suppose so and let me point out that ryan only recently moved to chicago is it two years now uh, coming up on three, about two and a half. But your, your progression into the freelancing scene has been pretty dramatic and pretty quick here. So whatever you're doing seems to be working. So uh, well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that there was like some magic like thing I could say, but it's just been, I've been lucky in a lot of ways. So it's been, it's been great. I want to say the, the other thing to make sure you're doing to make sure you, you either keep the gig or, or get more stuff out of it is to make sure that, you know, uh, all the all the little stuff, but make sure that you're making music when you're when you're actually in the oh, yeah. gig. It's not just about playing the notes and playing the notes in time. It's it's making really really good music. If you're if you have something musically to say and you you know just you're shaping your phrases well, you're blending with everyone. No one has to worry about you. If you're that person, then chances are you're gonna get hired again, or you'll you know they'll remember they'll remember the music more than they'll remember that you know your face that they remember you just being there so if you make good music your your chance of getting hired again go way up i've gotten hired for the next year in the middle of a service because i played something well (laughs) yeah yeah i think uh if you if you really luck out on a gig and it's a yearly thing like easter um a good idea, and, and again, this is if, if this is something you you know you want to do again. It was a great experience, great people, get great pay, and everything. Um, you could set a reminder. Uh, you know, if you know that they emailed you in February, you could set a reminder the week before they emailed you last year and say, just shoot a message to them, be like, hey, you know, I'm the schedule's filling up. I would love to play for you again. Uh, you know, let me know if you need me. Nothing pushy, not like you know, all right, we doing this, but like, yeah. uh, I think keeping that kind of just a little bit ahead of them just not too far but just a little bit like hey you know i'm i'm finishing up my schedule i'd love to do it again if you if you need um that's a really good way to make sure that they remember your name yeah and i think especially with music directors too i've, I've never ran into a music director who's been upset that i provided an, uh, a reminder or something or I, I recently had to find a sub for a gig and um i had very good reasons i going to be out of the country. So that came up kind of suddenly. Um, but I had a sub, a qualified sub, and I, you know, I, I had it all set up and he was a okay, happy that I had, I had the experience to travel and said, thank you so much for providing a sub on hand. It was great. You know, so I, I don't think a music director will ever be upset for a reminder that a good musician is, is able to play and willing to play. Cause I think for them, it's more, how do I find a qualified musician that it's going to be good? Yeah. Um, and Chris, you said something when you were talking um, about if they don't have to worry about you. And I think everything we were talking about, um, all the tips that you guys have been hearing up to now, I mean, these are all things that create you, that make you more stable in your in the director's eyes. And, you know, like um, if you're doing everything that Chris, Chris, and Ryan have been 
um, discussing. Um, if you're on time, if you come prepared, if you come more than prepared, you know, even if you make a mistake, um, make yourself uh, as the least object of worry as possible. And I think I think you're safe then to to be a, a great option for future gigs. Yeah. So, um, any final thoughts from three of you before we close? That was funny that we just started talking about music at the end of it, but <laughs> try to make music. Yeah. Always a good idea. You know, when I was in grad school, one of the studio classes, um, one of our, and this might be a good, a good thing for all you people out there listening to us to try out, but um, my trumpet teacher brought in these uh, German kids stories that were really, really old and they were all translated to English. So they were totally lost in translation and they just didn't really make sense. And I'm, my mother's from Germany, and I've had some of these stories read to me. Germans have pretty dark kid stories to begin with, <laughs> from my experience. So, But the, the challenge in the studio class was to read the story and make it interesting. And sometimes, um, especially in some, some of the liturgical music, it just does not make sense. And, like, it's not anything that you would choose to play in any type of music. But I always keep that in the back of my mind. Like, even when it doesn't make sense, what you, you still have to make a story out of it. You still have to make it interesting so what are you going to do with it um that's a cool exercise i like that that's great yeah yeah i should ask him for that that, that group of stories <laughs> great well thank you to all of you uh chris chris and ryan for joining us this morning uh, afternoon um and uh this has been a great first uh dennis wick first friday panel discussion i'm looking forward to all the future discussions we'll have maybe you guys will see chris chris or ryan again um, but stay tuned to our social media pages, Facebook, Instagram, for information on the next First Friday panel discussion we'll have. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Bye. Bye.